Welcome to the show, Nigel. Um, to start off with, can you tell us a little bit more about your role as a UN high-level climate champion, what that involves? Sure. Well, uh, is the role was created as part of the Paris Agreement when the, the countries, the parties, recognise that we can't tackle the climate crisis just at the level of federal governments alone. We need everybody, so particularly sub-national governments, you know, states, regions, cities, and the private sector and private finance. So the role was created to work with all of those non-party actors or non-state actors to drive ambition and action and climate change, so mitigation, resilience and finance in support of the implementation of the Paris Agreement. So that it's quite, quite a loosely defined role, which is nice. It means you can interpret it as you, as you wish. It's always uh, great to have a little bit of flexibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you tell us in, in the context of driving climate ambition, where are you seeing the greatest potential for action or, or momentum uh, across that different grouping of sectors? I mean, it's interesting. I think it, 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 it seems to move around, I would say, in Paris. Um, so six years ago, it was, it was cities were really leading the cities sort of as a group were the first to really embrace the need to get to net zero by 2050. Um, and then we, we've seen gradually um, businesses really step up and we now have thousands of businesses committing in a robust way to getting to net zero. But then just a, a year ago, really, the finance community really stepped up and I think they're all feeding back off each other. I mean, no, 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 one's, no one's isolated. And then, of course, in, in, in Glasgow, we had a real breakthrough in terms of the international ambition really being ratcheted up. So I think the, it, the, the leadership keeps moving around, but everybody's riffing off everybody else. And the higher education sector, universities, what kind of role can they play in, in, the, in the global talent? Huge role. Um, uh, I mean, first of all, we, you know, we created this big campaign called the Race to Zero. We have over a thousand global universities in the Race to Zero, so very significant. Um, I think multiple roles. One, one is as a laboratory. In most of those universities have set much earlier net zero um, or below zero or net positive, depending <laughs> on how you define the maths, um, goals of 2025, 2030. And of course, universities are microcosms of cities and microcosms of society. They have buildings, they have food, they have travel, they have um, power. So that, that's the first thing. It's a laboratory where faculty and students can learn and influence their broader community. Second, of course, is the research is crucial it means you know as an IPCC author that the science informs the world so, so business leaders finance leaders political leaders are, are guided by the science they sometimes might be frustratingly slow for you as one of the authors but, but definitely we see in the private sector real attention being paid to the science but of course also as 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 teachers and and as uh, and to inspire future future engineers future lawyers future politicians future leaders, and, and sometimes that future can come very quickly, right? So people who are graduating now will be influencing the, the, sh the shape of the world in leadership positions w within the first decade of their careers. So I'd like to think laboratory, um, you know, research and influencing policy, but also as a uh, creating the, the, the leaders of the future. I think sometimes when we're here in a country so far away from many others, we wonder, you know, what what difference does it make what we're doing in domestic constituencies on the on the climate challenge so from an international community perspective what's what's the importance of what different countries like Australia are doing uh, to contribute on the climate yeah, I mean, challenge I think as a developed country it's it's really important in the international context that all the developed countries are seen to be really um, pulling their weight because there's a, there's a lot of middle income and less developed countries who really struggle and don't have the kind of resources and the financial and, 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 um, and, and human to, to navigate this very, very complex transition. So firstly, it's as exemplars to um, play their part, but also to encourage others. But then also, um, it's really hard for anybody to do this. So um, just, just leading Puts some puts a country in a position to be more um, more more helpful to those who are maybe following. But I said the, the other thing increasingly is, is, is like that that we're seeing is that this is more and more now being seen as in a matter of competitiveness. So there's another there's another view which would say that well it doesn't matter if some countries are slow because it's better for those who go faster. Yeah, well that's a that's a great perspective to bring, particularly in Australia, to think about both the risks and the opportunities from action. So, thanks for joining us today for the podcast, uh, Nigel. It's been great to have you. Great, you're welcome. Thank you.